proportions um, is a little bit the question on which side we are on. For me, it seems that our world is just um, being divided into those two entities. And we need to find more than ever the right choice. <coughs> I come from Munich. A lot of Italians love it. Um, so uh, for all of those who have never been to the Oktoberfest, here a few images that had been taken by a friend of mine, a photographer, over the past 30 years. And he's just there with um, a Leica and just goes into it. He has no fear. <coughs> so those images are quite crude. And it makes it quite difficult also to know from which period they are. It ends with a kiss and hopefully very soon we are going to publish a book with his work. <coughs> so yes, I'm working in Munich for a company or with a company called Melville Brand Design that I founded a couple of years ago. I am also together with Julia in Karlsruhe editing the Slanted magazine and I'm teaching in Dortmund. <coughs> Dortmund is well known for its football club the BVB, and um, that's the only thing that is known about Dortmund. This is a work that I very much like. Uh, it was done by a student of mine two years ago, but I think it's worth showing it. Um, it's called Call of Duty, and forgive me for showing you on this talk not so much of typography, but a lot of fields that are in my interest and are beside typography. And this course that we had here was um, called in German Wirklich Wirklichkeitskonstruktion Krieg. So it was about how war is being received and seen in the media. And Mirko Müller examined how this game Call of Duty was being programmed and how at the same time it was being used for training purposes of drone pilots from the military uh, armies. And he got hold on material from the military army, how they test the software and just cut it with um, the software itself. So you never know if it's, if it's real or not. Personnel coming out of the church. We have armed personnel approaching from the church. Request permission to engage. Copy. You are cleared to engage the moving vehicle and any personnel around you see. Affirmative. Crew, you are cleared to engage, but do not fire on the church. So what we saw here is both a game and uh, reality. To take myself out of this madness, um, last year I decided to yeah, have a trip across the Atlantic. I wanted to go to New York, so I took a vessel. I didn't want to work. I had no computer. Um, <clears throat> there was no Wi-Fi on board. I started to read all kinds of things, like weather reports, um, yeah, all the devices that you could find on the bridge. Uh, quite interesting on this one here to see it, that uh, our route was 
going quite close to the place where the Titanic um, went to ground. <coughs> you have all kind of weird buttons like this one here, piracy attack alarm signal. Of course, you have all kind of devices and after a couple of days, I felt a little bit, I need to do something. It takes 14 days. So I saw the guys working there, asked them if I could help them. They were just laughing at me. Um, and then they said, okay, you could help us with some painting work. So I started with some painting work. And then they said, well, if you want to go help this guy up here. I said, no, that's way too far, way too dangerous. So I discovered that on this vessel, they have really problems with rust. And so what they do is they have, have to cover everything all the time. And in order to find, again, where they have to rewrite the numbers and the colors, they have those hewing points. So I went through all the vessel and had all those numbers redrawn. They asked me to do some stencil work. <laughs> And they had no, yeah, no knife, so it was with a kind of scissors to cut your nails. <laughs> and I had those stencils done, and it ended up with kind of karaoke <laughs> But it's pretty good, you know, to take yourself out of, yeah, this madness. In New York, um, we met somebody that all of us know and his name is Milton Glaser. I found out during the interview that he just bought a house. At that time he was 76 or 78 years old and he bought a second house in Woodstock. So somehow we came to talk about Woodstock and didn't talk about design that much. And um, yeah, just see his answer on this question here. It's quite funny. Well, not only have we been there, we were probably responsible for it. Because um, a friend of mine named Albert Grossman, uh, who was Bob Dylan's manager, and who I got to know and liked, uh, came up to see us one weekend, and we said, you know, there's a house for sale two blocks away. Uh, and we didn't know anybody had enough money to buy it. It was $5,000. No, I'm sorry, it was $50,000. Uh, and we took it to and he bought the house. Then about a year later, he asked us if, he knew, if we knew of a house for Dylan, Bob Dylan. He was the manager. And Shirley found a house for Dylan, and Dylan came and moved to Woodstock. And that was the beginning of the Woodstock Festival, because once Dylan was there, musicians started coming, and after a while there were a lot of good musicians there, the band, Janis Joplin, and so on. And somebody there who was smart said, you know, everybody knows Woodstock will make a festival. Even though the festival itself was about 30 miles away from Woodstock. So, it's funny. So that way, my wife created Woodstock. <laughs> Another guy that we met um, was um, responsible for the creation of the logos and all the signage and all the corporate design of the Olympics in 68 of Mexico. Lance Wyman and somehow during the interview we found out that Otto Eicher who <coughs> in 72 came to make the design for the Olympics in Munich visited him during this process. <coughs> I feel still ashamed about uh, what he told us about Otto Eicher. Oh, Atoll, Atoll Eicher, yeah, he visited us in Mexico. We were, we, I, well, I know we had 18 months to go because he said something that made, I, was, I, I went down with Peter Murdoch, an English designer, and uh, we were both young. I mean, I was 29, Peter was 27. I met him in London. He came to New York on scholarship, and we realized we worked very well together. 
And uh, we were actually going to start an office here in New York. I was going to leave the George Nelson office. So we wound up going to Mexico for the competition and um, got the competition. We started working and we had things, we had a little office. We had things all over the walls and we had the Mexico 68 established and we were applying it. And Otto walked in and he kind of walked in, looked around. He didn't even, I don't remember saying hello. He just walked in, you know. And he said, uh, we're further ahead than you, and then walked out. And Peter and I just looked at each other like, wow, what just happened? It was frightening, you know, because we knew that he had four years plus 18 months. We figured it out. We had 18 months before the Olympics happened, or were going to happen, and Otto had four years and 18 months, and he was saying he was further ahead. I mean, that was scary. That was really scary. The Germans, huh? So yeah, that's what we do uh, with Slanted. We try to go to places that we're interested in and um, make video interviews with people we like and try to make a magazine out of it. Uh, in January 2015, we had this terror attack in Paris and we decided to go to Paris long before it happened. So we were there um, of course, in Paris you have this mix of luxury, tourists, wonderful food, great museums. But at the same time, when we were there, all Paris was just um, <coughs> yeah, covered with um, signs of people who were just, you know, into this uh, grief of what happened. Uh, you had great... Um, posters everywhere, you had all kind of things that really, um, well you could see that there was a big interest of um, the people. Um, so at the same time, um, for us it was really interesting to, to see big figures of design. Um, some of them unfortunately don't live anymore like him, for example. Same for Frédéric Techner, studio who died last year. Mm, for me, mm, being a designer is also sometimes a little bit about compromises. <laughs> in the company we have now in Munich, we are architects, <coughs> we are post-production company, and Melville, my company, where we are designers. And we are all in the same building and we decided we need to find a way how we could um, produce a publication together. So one of the architects, he's really good in all kind of programming stuff and we asked him um, if he could yeah, create a software um, that has a, in the background a data bank and <coughs> all the images are just connected to text informations and the software creates the magazine by itself. So there's no discussion after it. Once it's done, it's done. We couldn't say we want this image to be on another space or a place. And that's how we created this um, publication. So it was a real fun process and the result um, was all generated automatically by the software itself. Just the cover then was designed by ourselves. Um, the office is uh, in the Goethestrasse, so that's why um, we called it Goethestrasse 20. The TGM, Typografische Gesellschaft Munich, invited us to be part of a kind of poster battle between Korean designers and German designers and we were invited to work with Byun, Byung In Kang, a great typographer who sent us some of his work. Of course we couldn't read them, we didn't know what it was about, <coughs> but we liked those signs that somehow looked like animals and to get in contact with him he was not able to speak English and we were not able to speak Korean. We started to cut out those 
shapes and um, build some kind of silly devices just to, you know, make some silly films and and that was all of a sudden the idea that maybe we could um, bring those shapes into kind of three-dimensional uh, artworks. <coughs> so later on he created those um, two pieces and this was the process then of having the design done for the two posters. So um, <coughs> we just yeah, took them again and built some kind of silly three-dimensional shapes and all of a sudden the posters were ready. I'm very much attracted to photography um, and eight years ago I met a photographer in London started to make books with him. This was the first book we designed about the mods, <coughs> those guys with the beautiful motorcycles. Uh, we had a couple of great exhibitions and of course if you work for the mods or make a book about the mods you can make a book about the rockers. And so we started to have the second book here with the rockers and he took me to a very small tiny store um, in London where I discovered all of a sudden that they had beautiful jackets. Later for the book release we were <coughs> in the Ace Coffee in London. Rockers used to be in this place to drive around with their motorcycles as fast as possible. So that's where the name Coffee House Racer comes from. Horst was there with all those rockers. I never imagined being in between all those really weird guys. Um, this is Trini, he's not able to read and um, is an analphabet. But all of a sudden he was reading our book. So this was a great moment. And on that day we decided to make a book about rocket jackets. Um, it's a very big book um, and it's dedicated to the beauty of those jackets. What is amazing about Horst, it took it half a year to make all those pictures. Um, so this book was made in a very short time, um, something that don't happen that often. Um, we <coughs> had last year an idea where we thought this would be a very good idea to get new clients um, and make a lot of money. So we created a book um, dedicated to brands that are manufactured, um, that are small brands, that yeah, are for gentlemen, urban gentlemen. So we called a lot of companies and yeah, in half a year time we had this book designed. Um, we made a few tries on how could the cover look like. So first we wanted to have a kind of tattooed hand on the cover but it didn't, didn't feel right. Um, so at the end it was this kind of design. Um, like a dedication to this manufacturing. Um, the book comes along with um, <coughs> a store finder and it was very successful. So successful that um, a couple of weeks ago we got a really serious letter um, from a company that all of you know. So I would kindly ask you never buy a G-Star again. They charged us 250,000 euros um, and what is really funny, 31 euro 90 for the one copy they bought. Um, <coughs> we made a mistake. We didn't knew that the word raw belongs to G-Star. Um, and even if put on the title of a book, you're not allowed to wor use the word raw. So it's quite amazing that after almost 25 years of experience in making books, uh, I'm still a child not knowing that you really have to cross-check everything nowadays. Um, we should have known. 
At the end now, I think we are going to pay like 25,000 euros, but it hurts. I mean, is that what was the income of making this book? Never mind, we, we got a quite a lot of new clients, so it's fine at the end. But we should have known, as this guy should have known. So Belgium is a beautiful city. So Belgium is a beautiful city. Yeah. Um, we should have known that a lot of things are not good. I mean, um, I'm, I'm always in this feeling of, okay, I make a magazine about graphic design but, or about typography, but for what, for who, what is it about, and how could I bring in content that is um, going beyond the beauty of the typefaces. I met um, a great guy at Corbis, who um, Ken Johnson, who is responsible for the image archive of Corbis. And what is amazing about Corbis is that um, they were the very first ones who tagged um, really seriously all their images. It happened in a way that the photographers went on a reportage and had a small writing machine, um, developed the pictures, and then write down the text and just pinned it on the back side of the picture and that then went to the publishing houses and they ha they kept those images and so on the comic issue about comic fonts we decided to make like a kind of photo story about um, something that happened in the 50s and the desert of Nevada close to Las Vegas it's called Doomtown and <coughs> it was a city that was built Probably all of you know this story, but I think it's still fascinating. Um, a city was built with um, test dummies, and those test dummies were put into um, kind of places like family homes and um, dinner, and then uh, the bomb was exploded. Here is a small video footage that shows what happens exactly. Four, three, two. One, zero. House number one as the blast hits it. On news knob, civil defense observers witness effects of the blast and the tremendous glare of the fireball. Here again is house number one collapsing. Shown now in stop motion. First an intense light. The heat flash strikes, charring the outer surface of the house without causing fire. Foaming, blackened particles of whitewash are forced upward by the heat flash. In the right corner of the screen, smoke rises from the wooden base of the metal floodlight pole. The scene darkens as the blast wave brings heavy clouds of dust. The forward part of the roof is snapped upward like a lid, crashing into the rear yard. Now the blast wave gets inside and the house, under tremendous pressure, blows apart. Remember, what you have seen here in detail happened in just two and one-third seconds. Yeah, so we, we, we used this footage with the or, original captions and asked the type designers to create type charts using those kind of words that, it, that are come in comics like explosions and stuff like that. Um, somehow, yeah, those dummies are also probably influenced very much Kraftwerk. Um, <coughs> I mean, what is happening here, the caption is that this guy is going, shows, ah, uh, no, nothing happened really. It's, he's still okay, you know, you have just small little pieces of things in his cravat and that's it <laughs> and even people went there to dance um, in front of the scenery um, this picture was taken in the middle of the night but the sky was illuminated by the blast so yeah it's about typography recently I found out that um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory um, that is the company that 
helped building the bombs now has a great video archive where they show about 60 films of those blasts that happened between 45 and 62. It's a really very interesting website. But okay, we should switch to birth. Um, in one of the issues dedicated to fond families, uh, again, we worked with Corbis and I was really excited that I would be one day in my life publishing a picture of Diana um, and Charles in the context of typography and not rainbow press. Um, so here again, it was this idea of bringing photography um, with font charts and by that illuminating the beauty of both the pictures and the typefaces. Tomasz Tomaszewski um, is one of the most famous um, Polish photographers uh, where we were very happy to um, got hold on those beautiful images from Poland of today on the countryside. His story is called The Stone's Throw. Those images are, um, yeah, they, they've been done in the last 10 years. Um, because of Slanted, I came to Poland, a country that I didn't know before, and um, it's quite interesting that Poland is really divided into the capital, Warsaw, and the countryside that is still really, really countryside. So um, we made this special edition with his images in a small publication. And special editions are really a great tool for marketing. So it helps um, to promote a magazine. Mm, probably most of you um, know this calendar here. Uh, it's now in its 10th issue. We never expected it to be such a success, but maybe it is just a success because the idea was so stupid and so easy. It was just on the front side, uh, the typeface, and on the back side, um, yeah, just the name of the label and a sentence or a few letters. It is published by Hermann Schmidt. And because it was such a success, we had the idea to do the same with Polaroid images. Mm, <coughs> so we had this Polaroid calendar coming up. At some point, Polaroid, the company, asked us, yeah, please take out the name of Polaroid in your calendar. So we had to change the name. Um, but it was net, not that serious like um, G-Star. And last year, we decided to yeah, publish a private Polaroid. It's quite interesting that the media of Polaroid is, um, because of the way how a Polaroid is being done, um, you could have this intimacy of your home. You don't need to bring a film to a lab. And so uh, over the years, we got a lot of um, nude Polaroid pictures and published them in this calendar. And this year, we thought, well, we, we could go a step further and could you know, bring in more explicit images into the calendar. And the publisher was, at the beginning, yeah, very, very open-minded to it. And on the day we went to print, he said, well, he went through all the images and he said, no, we, we are not going to publish it. It's, it's way too, too explicit. And so we had all this discussion with him, what is explicit and what is about a penis uh, that is different about the boobs and, and so on and so on. Um, so at the end, we, we, we said, well, look, I mean, it's about Polaroid images, about the beauty of those images at, at the same time. And we just came up with a very simple idea that now <coughs> comes along with a calendar, a set of stickers that you could auto-censor those images that you feel being too explicit. <coughs> Talking about censorship, um, when we've been to Istanbul for the Istanbul issue, um, 
we expected to, to see a lot of great design studios there, but in fact we uh, came to Istanbul at a period of time where Taksim um, and Gizi Park um, things just happened. So the city was still uploaded with all um, this revolutionary thinking. Better than in graphic design, it is expressed in, in the field of art. So we met a lot of incredibly great artists like Burak Delier or Mehmet Ali Turkmen. Um, a lot of their work is really related to um, yeah, the, the situation there, but nowadays all of these artists don't live anymore in Istanbul. All the artists we met that were published in this issue uh, live abroad, and one of them, unfortunately, um, is in jail. So things really changed a lot there. Südkan Moral, a great woman, was in jail for this picture that she took as a protest that it is allowed for a man to marry three or four women, but not the other way around. Um, it was before Erdogan was so powerful, um, but still she was in jail for about two months for this image. And in protest for being here in jail, she took this picture um, <coughs> when she came out, but at that moment she was so much into the media that nothing happened again. Um, because of Slanted, we met a lot of great artists and a lot of, a lot of great illustrators. So we started um, a small publishing project, artist project, um, that has only been printed on demand. And um, those are small books, about 100 pages. The book costs 10 euros, that's why we call it 100 for 10. We even made the promotion with devices like Fiverr. And this is a film that we commissioned for $10 maybe. Hi! Print is dead. It's never dead. To publish a book is a bad idea. It's a very good idea. 100 for 10 is a series of artists' monographs designed by artists we love. Each book presents outstanding illustrations, graphics, and photographies on a hundred pages for only 10 euros. Check www.100for10.com now. So it's five dollars for him and it's another five dollars that he wears a tie and it's another five dollars for the URL. Um, and to give you an idea what um, this publishing project is about, um, here a short um, version of it. So all of the illustrators have carte blanche, all the illustrators and the photographers. Uh, we just asked them to um, make a good storyline of 100 pages um, and the book are only available online. By now we published over um, 80 books almost. We had really great books um, from very famous people. Maybe for those of you who are interested in uh, Edward Feller who, who know him, uh, we published a beautiful sticker book with all his designs. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a real fun project of ours. Covers are always something that um, yeah, cause a lot of headache and I learned for myself that when designing a magazine, um, for me it's better at least to design the cover at the end and not at the beginning. And it takes like four or five issues before the magazine really feels like now it's there, now it works. It needs its time. Um, those were the first covers of Slanted Magazine. We tried out a lot. 
Uh, the first ones were printed digitally. Um, here we had just like kind of wrapping around the cover so that you could have an issue with um, posters being done. Later on, when we started to travel, we had yeah, decided to be more corporate on the cover so that um, people could see the magazine and understand that's the same series of magazine. Uh, it was a great idea to reduce the format because now the magazine is uh, easily being taken um, into a handbag. But we still yeah, try to, to work with all kinds of different persons. Here this was uh, printed by Letter Jazz, the Istanbul issue, so we just took the logo of Istanbul and made a NAS of it. And Letter Jazz printed um, six and a half thousand copies by hand. A tremendous work and uh, it's just beautiful. On the Paris issue, we, we, yeah, we just thought maybe we could do something with dedicated to fashion. Um, and again, of course, I, I went through all kinds of image archives. I, I found this one here. I found this one here and um, yeah, thought, well, this, this could be a cover. Um, but it was more kind of joke. I sent it to Julia, who is living in Karlsruhe while I'm living in Munich. And she was saying, well, you're totally nuts. Never, ever, this is going to be the cover of the Slanted Paris issue. So I said, oh, maybe we could go for something more kitsch. Um, and I knew that she loves pink. She, she loves this color. And so it was this idea to have a cover that is like, yeah, on one hand side, a little bit sensitive, sexual, but also like, like a dog shit. Uh, and what is funny about France is my, that, 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 that the, the, the presidents are still in the same palace than Louis XIV. Um, so yeah, we, we had this golden cover then being done and that was quite a nice story about this cover for us. And for the Warsaw issue, um, the iconic building of Warsaw is this cultural palace. So it was obvious that old trick of designers, you just switch something on 180 degrees. Um, maybe this could have been the cover, but it was too cheesy. Um, so at the end, it was more like a kind of typographic cover. The inside of the magazine was very much influenced by this building, playing on the symmetry and the discordance of the symmetry. We had Hubert Jocham designing a typeface for the headlines. Um, <clears throat> on the Helsinki issue that was just published uh, a couple of weeks ago, we first wanted to go for this cover here. And in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, on a rainy day, I explained how the cover might look like to um, Ian Lynham, and he asked me, well, what, what is the, um, the symbol of Helsinki? I knew that Julia didn't like the cover that I designed, so I said, yeah, the symbol is, and I, it, there was fog and rainy day, so on the window of the, the cab, I just with my finger designed the shape of the crone and the boat, and, and that's how this idea then came up. So on the evening, I just designed it, sent it to Julia, and she was already going to print with a cover and said, no way, we're we are on print already, and I said, no, we, 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 we definitely need to, to change the cover. Um, so now we are super happy about it. It's so much better. <laughs> um, the Yearbook of Type um, is a project that tries to give an inside view on contemporary typefaces from type publishers and type designers that we cherish, that we like. We started this project in 2012. Um, we had another edition in 2014. And the book is presenting the typefaces. On the left side, it's uh, this type 
chart on the right side, it's an explanation about who designed it and uh, what is special about the font that you could see. And at the end, there's a section um, that brings knowledge about our articles, about um, type tutorials, essays, dedicated to creating typefaces. Um, of course, you have an index of all the people who are in the book. And right now, we are on the way to publish the third edition. So for those of you who are interested in joining this project, um, you're invited. All of what you have seen today would not have been possible without um, the work of Julia Karl uh, in Karlsruhe and my partners in Munich, Florian Brugger, Yumi Kimoto, Johannes König, and Michael Schmidt. And <coughs> before I end... Because um, wherever we live, whoever we are... You know this one we here. We all share the same responsibility. Make our planet great again. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Kerning for inviting me. Thank you very much to all the beautiful organization in this beautiful place, in this wonderful theater, and enjoy all the other talks. Thank you so much. <laughs>